uh, introduce to you uh, Mary Coolidge. Um, she is from the Portland Audubon, and she's been on the Portland Audubon's conservation team since 2008. Uh, Mary is dedicated to efforts to make urban environments more hospitable to wildlife and helping to connect. She splits her, net, her time uh, between the Center for Diversity and Environment, you can say a little bit about that, and uh, fascinatingly, the Oregon Zoo's condor, uh, California condor breeding facility, and of course, Portland Audubon. She spends her free time beekeeping, bird watching, horseback riding, mushroom hunting, and occasionally uh, escaping to meander, uh, to a meandering river to fly fish. Um, Mary, uh, it's all yours. Hi, thank you, John. Um, thank you, Tim, for having me. And I appreciate everybody being here tonight on such a gorgeous night. I know it's hard to be sitting in front of computer screens or in rooms anywhere. Um, we've really earned some blue sky, right? Um, it's so great to be here tonight. I really love to talk about this subject of dark sky preservation, um, particularly right around migration season. And we are on the eve here of peak migration in Oregon, which starts on Friday. Obviously, you all know that birds are already moving north. Um, and in all the various directions they do move. So they're migrating already, but the peak starts on Friday. And so many of them are arriving under the cover of darkness. So this is a really great time to be um, thinking about how we make our skies safer for our migrants. And I am going to share my screen. Hopefully everybody can see this now. Um, some folks may have heard me talking with Tim about this photo. This is a photo by Haroon Memedinovich. He is one half of the Sky Glow project. Hopefully some folks have heard of, of this project. It's really quite incredible. He and his partner, Gavin Heffernan, have gone to some of the most amazingly dark sky places in the United States and beyond and taken photos um, in an effort to raise awareness about light pollution. And really they've just produced such an incredible compendium of photographs. And this one happens to be a composite photo of downtown LA and a really gorgeous uh, Milky Way studded night sky. I'm not sure where that photo came from, but they sandwich them together. And I think this always does a really nice job of capturing our imaginations about the stars that are overhead every night of the year. Um, assuming we had clear skies, and if only we could draw back the curtain of light pollution. Um, so if you haven't heard of the Sky Glow Project, I really highly recommend that you check it out if this is something that you're interested in. So just a little overview of where we're gonna go tonight. We're gonna start out talking about what light pollution is, just so we're all on the same page. What the primary impacts are in terms of ecological health, human health, equity considerations, energy and climate considerations, uh, solutions or best practices in lighting design that have been developed, what's happening in Oregon, and also how you can get involved if this um, captures your interest tonight. <clears throat> I included the um, cover photo of this book, Ecological Consequences of Artificial Night Lighting, because this is sort of where it all began for me. Um, when I started at Portland Audubon back in 2008, one of the first projects I took on was developing a community science project, um, looking at window collision issues in downtown Portland. And I pretty soon ran into the issue of light pollution as an important factor in influencing window collisions. And I tried to get my hands on whatever information I could get on what was happening at night with our ecological systems and light pollution. And this is what I came up with first. Um, this is really, I think, a seminal volume of work that uh, Catherine Rich and Travis Longcourt edited. Um, they're both from the University of Southern California. Travis is really considered one of the foremost authorities on light pollution impacts on wildlife in the United States at this point. So really interesting book that just got me hooked. And back at this time, there really wasn't a whole lot out there. There was certainly research going on about light pollution and its impacts on ecological systems, but it certainly wasn't very mainstream. 
and there was not a lot of media on it. It hadn't really made it much into mainstream thinking. And really, all of that has changed now. I mean, anywhere you look, you can find articles written on dark skies, dark sky preservation, light pollution and its impacts. Um, everywhere from the New York Times to the LA Times, CNN, um, The Guardian, Wired, uh, Forbes, National Geographic are all writing about this issue. So hopefully folks have this to some extent front and center in some of the media that you're consuming and you're a little bit up on what's happening out there. Uh, okay, so I wanna back up a little bit and just kind of set the stage for this conversation. So for four and a half billion years, there was no electric artificial light on this planet and all biological systems evolved under these uh, regular conditions of bright days and dark nights. And that set up all of our biological processes to be governed by those light dark cycles, which is what we call circadian rhythms. This is essentially our master clock on earth. And even though we've really started to mess with it, it is still our master clock on earth. But all of that has changed in about the last 130 years or so. Humans have really started to light the night on a global scale. And that started pretty much with the installation of electric street lighting on our city streets in the late 1800s. And today, most human beings, as I think we probably all know, live in urban areas where we are awash in light constantly, all night long. Um, light from street lights, from billboards, from sports fields. And we, of course, need light at night. It is definitely serving a purpose so that we can extend our activities into dark hours, especially as we know up here in the Pacific Northwest when um, we have so little light in the dead of winter. But light at night is not benign. And so we really need to be thinking about how we can design our lighting thoughtfully so we're not having such a tremendous impact. Um, on our nocturnal systems. This is something called the Bortle scale. This was developed in 2001 by a guy named John Bortle, and it is a tool for amateur astronomers to compare the relative darkness of their observation sites. Uh, this scale is read from right to left. On the right-hand side is a class one excellent dark sky site. And then you read it over to the left until you get to an eight or nine inner city sky site. And you can see if you look at this night sky image across the top that as you move from right to left, the influence of light pollution starts to drown out the stars. Pretty intuitive stuff. Now in Oregon, if you want world-class night skies, you gotta get over to the Albor Desert, Steens Mountain, Heart Mountain, Summer Lake are all great places to see pristine night skies. Hopefully everybody has been out there if you haven't make a plan to get out there. Not only are the birds incredible, um, but so are the night skies. And then over here on the left, Portland, Eugene, Salem, I am sorry to say has joined the ranks of us all the way here on the left end of the spectrum. Now this is in our inner city. So there are certainly gonna be parts of Salem um, and even these other cities that are not quite an eight or nine on the Bortle scale at this point. This is essentially what that looks like on a map. This is an excerpt of the New World Atlas of Artificial Night Sky Brightness. This is just an excerpt of the United States. And um, you can see, this is a global map of light pollution. You can see that east of the Mississippi here, um, they're really in a lot of trouble. There is not a lot of dark sky left to preserve in the United States. West of the Mississippi, we're in much better, uh, much better situation, though we have plenty of light pollution. And you can see here's a pullout of Oregon. There's pretty much almost continuous light pollution down the I-5 corridor from Portland through Salem, Eugene, et cetera. We do have, I want to point out, um, this incredible area of dark skies in southeastern Oregon. This is the largest intact area of world-class night skies in the lower 48 states. So we do have a tremendous night sky resource right here in our own state. Uh, when these researchers published this, uh, these findings, they also reported that when they overlaid the light pollution data with census data, they found that 99% of people in the U.S. live under light polluted skies and 80% of people can't see the Milky Way from where they live. 
So pretty sobering when you think about our cultural history really involving having access, our human cultural history, having access to the night sky every night of the year. I wanna stay zoomed in on Oregon for a minute. Um, this uses pretty much the same technology of that previous map, but this is an all skylight pollution ratio model developed by a guy named Dan Dorisco, um, who has a company called Night Sky Metrics. And this is a 2012 light pollution map of Oregon. And I'll just call your attention here primarily to the Portland Salem area. Um, if we go back to the Bortle scale for a moment, Red um, city suburban transition, white is this inner city sky. Now we go back here. So here's the inner city sky. Here's that transition zone in red. Salem, it's a little hard to pick out, has white at the center of it. So that worst um, on the scale of light pollution and then red around that. Now I'm going to jump to a 2020 image. Watch what happens in the Portland Salem area. I'm going to go back and I'm going to go forward. You can see that this transition area has now joined between Portland and Salem. Also, this white area around Portland and, and in Salem have both expanded. So I'm just going to do that a couple more times so you can get a look at that. So light pollution is growing is essentially the moral of this story, right? We are, we are heading in a direction of losing what we have left of our night skies. Um, even, you know, even in some of the darkest areas in Oregon, light pollution is really starting to encroach there. And this is how we get there. So we have a tendency to have lights that are unshielded, that are too bright for what they're needed for, and that are on all night long. And so um, I imagine that probably in Salem, in Portland, this is a very familiar site. We see parking light lots that are illuminated all night long, even when there is not a soul in there. Um, we also have billboards, obviously, that are lit from the bottom up, which means that all this light just skins right off of that billboard and goes up into the night sky, and then unshielded lighting. So essentially poor lighting design. Uh, this is a graphic. There are a lot of them out there that really try to illustrate useful light versus uh, light trespass and sky glow. So here is the area of useful light. This is the area that we are trying to illuminate. Um, then there's this glare zone here. So if you're standing over here, that and you're looking directly at the, this light source, that's going to create glare. It's going to constrict your pupils. It may even cause um, discomfort in your eyes. This creates light trespass that's um, that's ending up in areas where it's not intended to be, maybe your neighbor's home, maybe a sensitive wildlife area adjacent to a property that has some lighting. And then of course, as you know, particularly in the Pacific Northwest where we have a lot of wet nights, um, every surface that light um, hits, will um, that light will bounce off of that surface, particularly if it's wet. So a lot of this light is gonna end up in the sky. Um, so all of this is useless light that is really a waste of energy um, and also having unintended consequences. So what can we do to really make sure that we're thinking about how we can design our lighting better? Folks probably know that we are in an era of mass conversion from high pressure sodium lights of uh, years past to LEDs. Now, LEDs are fantastic. They're long lived. They're um, they're low in, in terms of energy consumption. Um, they're relatively maintenance free. So they're, they're a good idea in terms of um, modernization of our lighting. But we have choices to make when we are converting to LEDs. And so this is the um, spectral output of an LED that is particularly a 4,000 Kelvin LED. When we're talking about Kelvins, we're talking about the perceived color temperature of a light. Now this doesn't, this graph doesn't describe every 4,000 Kelvin LED out there. This can vary, um, but it is a common wavelength output of a 4,000 Kelvin LED. Wavelengths over here to the left, these are short wavelengths and they're relatively blue and purple. Wavelengths over here on the right hand side are longer wavelengths. They're redder, they're warmer. The short wavelength photons have more energy and they bounce around more. That means more light ending up in the night sky, bouncing off of dust and water particles in the atmosphere, which increases sky glow. 
Um, this kind of light tends to have a spike right around 450 nanometers in this wavelength output, which happens to be the peak sensitivity area for birds and mammals. It's also a spectral output that really mimics daylight and it suppresses melatonin secretion in humans and other vertebrates. It essentially tells our brains that it is time to wake up. It is like daylight. Uh, increasingly, we are seeing 4,000 Kelvin lighting being deployed as street lights, um, as parking lot lights. Uh, we see it virtually everywhere. And the American Medical Association has actually cited human health concerns about this kind of lighting. And we're gonna get a little bit more into that later in the program. Uh, there have been um, hundreds of peer-reviewed published research papers at this point looking at the impacts of light pollution on individual species up to ecological systems, and quite literally none of it is good news. It, it is all bad news for our ecological systems. And this is, this is just a tiny, a tiny sample of titles of research papers that are looking at this issue. So when we're talking about ecological light pollution, ecosystems are incredibly complex. And when we are introducing artificial light at night, we are really interrupting these very, very carefully choreographed relationships between species that are inhabiting an ecosystem. Um, first of all, the, um, the impact on circadian rhythms, which drive breed, things like breeding, nesting behaviors, migration timing, foraging, um, bud burst timing in um, trees and other plants, leaf drop um, at the end of the growing season. Uh, some things that we are probably somewhat familiar with, uh, light pollution can confuse celestial navigation. So we're thinking about birds, particularly when we think about that, can cause misorientation and nocturnal movements. Think of everything you've ever heard about Pacific sea turtle hatchlings, um, that emerge at night and need to make it out to the ocean and instead end up up the beach toward light pollution. Uh, light pollution can result in attraction or repulsion behaviors depending on different species. Um, it can actually fragment habitat. It can reduce fledgling success in birds and it can interfere with predator prey relationships. So we'll look at some examples of this. Uh, impacts of light pollution have been uh, described in at least 200 species represented uh, from every taxa. So it's quite widespread. Here are just a few examples. Uh, dung beetles use the Milky Way to orient themselves. Really pretty incredible for this tiny insect. Harbor seals have been demonstrated to use load stars to orient when they're out in open water with no terrestrial landmarks. They'll pick out a star on the horizon and they'll follow it till it drops out of view. They'll already have a second one lined up to continue to follow. So really important for them to be able to navigate. Misorientation, like I just mentioned, um, sea turtles that end up moving up the beach towards light um, on roads and houses and things like that instead of down the beach to get into the water, which is the only way they're gonna survive. And lights from miles and miles away can actually attract them. So it isn't even just beachfront lighting. Luckily, a lot has been done to try to correct this issue. Uh, reduced fledgling success. So it's been shown that birds that are nesting under white lights have elevated corticosterone or uh, stress hormone levels in their systems. And that has been correlated with a reduced ability to fledge young successfully out of their nests. There's even been shown circadian perturbance in monarchs, which are actually diurnal migrants. Um, so we're not just impacting nocturnal migration in birds that migrate at night, but also some diurnal migrants are being perturbed by exposure to artificial light at night. Uh, Predator-prey relationships, and we'll look a little bit more in depth at that, they can be impacted by light pollution. Um, Eastern redback salamanders have been shown to delay their emergence for an hour or more, even when they're exposed to very dim lighting at night, which has um, implications for their ability to find mates and forage and um, explore new territories. Decreased connectivity um, or habitat fragmentation in many bat species, we'll look a little bit more at that. And then mass insect uh, attraction to light. I don't know if folks remember a couple of years ago, this happened in Las Vegas where millions 
of um, crickets were attracted into Las Vegas, which wasn't good for the crickets, certainly, or grasshoppers rather, and it was certainly not good for tourism in Las Vegas when that happened. Okay, so let's dig a little bit into bird migration. Uh, folks probably know that about 70% of our North American birds are migratory and over 80% of those birds migrate at night. So this is our warblers, our sparrows, thrushes, tanagers, king, king, kinglets, um, grosbeaks. And they do this because the atmosphere is less turbulent at night, it's cooler, they can preserve daytime hours for foraging, uh, they can avoid uh, diurnal predators, and they are also using the stars to navigate. And they'll take off about 30 to 45 minutes about after sunset, and they will fly all night long if conditions are good, uh, unless they come into areas where there is a lot of light pollution. Folks may remember uh, the Galveston Standard Insurance Building in May of 2017 got a lot of media attention because 398 birds that had just crossed the Gulf crashed into this building. Uh, all but three of them died on impact. Three of them were taken to rehab. I'm not actually sure what their ultimate fate was, but the Standard Insurance Building did elect to participate in the seasonal lights out program in Texas for the remainder of the season. I'm kind of assuming they have continued to participate, but I don't really know. Um, so you can see they've reduced their lighting quite considerably in this photo on the right as compared to the photo on the left. The photo on the bottom is the NASCAR Hall of Fame in Charlotte, North Carolina. And back in October of 2019, 310 chimney swifts collided with this building. You can see it's quite lit. It's really also only probably the equivalent of a two-story building. So it does not take a high-rise building to actually pose a hazard for birds on the landscape um, or lure them in. And um, I'm gonna diverge us just momentary, momentarily into the issue of window collisions, which is, um, as we've just seen here in the previous slide, a related issue. We know that window collisions are estimated to kill somewhere between 365 million and 1 billion birds every year in North America. Um, even if we take the low end of that estimate, that's a million birds a day. Um, we also know from a paper out of Cornell, the Rosenberg paper in 2019, that we have lost about 30% of our North American migratory birds in the last 50 years. So our birds are in trouble and window collisions are among the top three issues that are putting pressure on them after habitat destruction and cats. Um, so we really do want to get a handle on this issue and anything that is factoring into it. Daytime collisions occur um, for birds that are residents in any area, but also for birds that are migrants that are moving through an area, they are pulled into an urbanized area where there's a lot of light pollution, they spend the remainder of the night there, they wake up in the city, they are in a sea of reflective glass, and this gets them into trouble. Birds just don't see reflections in glass as an obstruction to their potential flight path, and they collide with it. In some cases, glass is transparent and they can see all the way through to habitat on the other side of the glass. Again, they are gonna read that um, as, a, as an open pathway. Most of the birds that are running into windows are accustomed to navigating really small pathways in vegetation. And so they don't really need a huge plate glass window or a giant high rise building for it to pose a threat to them. They can run into a relatively small area of glass that is reflecting vegetation. Um, most collisions occur within the first 40 to 60 feet of the ground. That's because that's where birds are spending most of their time foraging, nesting. Um, mating, all of those kinds of things. Most of that activity is occurring within the first 40 to 60 feet of the ground. And we also know that reflection of trees and vegetation increases the risk factor at a building, as well as the presence of feeders and other attractants near windows. Okay, so let's get back for a moment to um, night migration. Folks are, are probably aware that researchers are now using radar ecology um, to track bird movement at night. We have 143 Doppler weather radar stations across the United States. 
And migrating birds have a unique signature that shows up on this weather radar. So researchers at Colorado State University's Aero Eco Lab and um, Cornell are watching the, these um, radar maps and they are also looking at weather conditions, atmospheric pressure, all of those kinds of things. And they are making predictions about when we're gonna have really big movements of birds. And they are issuing red, orange, and yellow alerts. This is an incredible tool for us to be able to get the word out on the few nights when it is gonna be most impactful for people to turn off their unnecessary light at night. Now, of course, the objective is for us to scale that up and really get people thinking about how they can change all of their lighting decisions year round instead of just on these peak migration nights. So if I can put my um, front porch light on a motion sensor or if I can turn it off when I go to bed during peak migration season, can I consider doing that year round? Does that still feel safe to me? Uh, there is another excellent tool that I think Tim brought up tonight which is Cornell's BirdCast uh, migration dashboard. And you can actually watch migration numbers in real time, or you can check it the following morning and you can do it by state or by county. I don't think you can do it by city at this point. And you can look to see what the peak numbers were the night before. You can look to see who um, they expected based on eBird data to be moving the night before and maybe even in the coming night. So it's a really incredible tool. Okay, let's talk about a few other examples. So this is the Purple Martin, and there was a paper that came out in 2021 that found that springtime pre-migration season exposure to artificial light at night for Purple Martins um, that had more than 10 nights of artificial light exposure actually migrated over a week earlier than those that did not experience this same amount of artificial light at night pre-spring migration. So it's really interesting. We're not just impacting nocturnal behaviors of uh, nocturnal animals or nocturnal behaviors of diurnal animals. We're also impacting even diurnal behaviors uh, that we wouldn't have thought might have had this kind of relationship, and yet it does. So hearkening back to something I mentioned a little bit earlier, which is that monarch butterflies, also a, a diurnal migrant, are um, again impacted by exposure to artificial light at night, which perturbs their circadian rhythms. Disease transmission, I made brief allusion to this. So this is some research that came out of Meredith Kernbach's lab at the University of South Florida. What she did was she took 50 house sparrows and she divided them into two populations in her lab. 25 of them she exposed to very dim uh, uh, light over, uh, overnight. The other 25 she allowed to sleep in complete darkness. She exposed them all at the beginning of the study to West Nile virus. And then she evaluated them to see how long it took them to uh, depress the infectiousness of the West Nile virus in their system so that it was no longer transmissible. And she found that the birds that slept in darkness um, were able to kick that virus out of their systems twice as quickly as the birds that spent the night in even dim light at night. Now, this is a zoonotic disease. So this is something that can be passed by mosquitoes um, from birds to humans. So, and it's really a disease you don't wanna get. It's potentially deadly. Um, so this does have public health implications if we start to artificially elevate um, disease transmission levels in our relatively common ur urban bird populations, right? Bats, um, bats are much maligned, but they are actually really cool. Bats can eat about half of their body weight in a single night in insects. And actually a lactating female can eat her own, her, her entire body weight in insects in a single night. So they are performing a really important ecosystem services or service for those of us who don't love mosquitoes. Um, there are about 1400 species of bats in the world, 15 of which occur in Oregon. And eight of them are listed in the Oregon Conservation uh, Strategy. Uh, that ODFW puts out. So they are, those eight species are species of concern. 
Some bats are likely to be attracted to lights and others are likely to be repelled. The ones that have asterisks next to them are bats that are known to actually forage at streetlights. So they are taking advantage of streetlights and the buffet that can sometimes occur at those lights. The bats that will hang around streetlights tend to be faster flying bats. So they're a little bit less vulnerable to avian or owl predation at night than the bats that are slower flyers. And the other, the slower flyers have a tendency to really be repelled by light. Now, uh, light pollution is emerging as one of the primary factors that is influencing bat activity when they're when folks are researching them. So um, it's not just impervious surfaces, it's not just insecticides and things like that. It is also light pollution that's really impacting their behavior and their ability to survive. Uh, invertebrates, so insects. We know now that white light LEDs uh, can in some cases attract up to 48% more insects than their high pressure sodium predecessors which is really important because again, if we start thinking of these lights as buffets, this has important impacts on insect populations. It also means that those insects that are supposed to be out pollinating at night, maybe even pollinating important agricultural crops are not doing that because they are stuck up here in these lights at night. Incidentally, I took this photo at Timber Stadium, I think two summers ago now, I feel like it's rather unusual, at least in Western Oregon, certainly in the Willamette Valley, to see a ton of insects at lights like this. So I was very surprised to see this. Um, but yeah, here they are creating a buffet at those lights. There has been some really interesting research. This is a, a paper out of Germany where they studied the biomass of flying insects and found that they had dec decreased more than 75% in the course of 27 years. And then they found a correlation between light pollution and declines in those insect populations. So they overlaid this data with light pollution data and found that there was a statistically significant correlation here. Um, this is another paper, light pollution as a driver of insect declines, Owens 2019 that actually says artificial light at night in combination with habitat loss, chemical pollution, invasive species, and climate change is driving insect declines. So it may not on its own be putting insects out of business, but it is certainly having a cumulative impact when looked at together with all of these other things that are really putting pressures um, on various members of our ecosystem. So this is a study that looked at predator-prey relationships. We know that moonlight has an influence on predator-prey interactions. Short-eared owls um, have more success at finding and capturing prey as available light increases. However, their prey species like deer mice suppress their activity under full moon nights. So they will uh, forage less, they will forage closer to home, they will stay in denser vegetation on full moonlight nights. Um, now, this is a, again, a very carefully balanced relationship between deer mice and short-eared owls that has been developed over millennia. And now we come in with street lights and parking lot lights and safety lighting. You know, even at Malheur National Wildlife Refuge, you can find artificial light that is on all night long on some of their buildings. So they are absolutely impacting short-eared owl behavior in those cases. Okay, let's jump to human health. So there is a lot that we don't actually know yet about the impact of light pollution on human health, but there are some things we do know. We have non-image forming cells in our eyes that are photosensitive. And when light strikes those cells, it tells our brain that it is time to wake up. It doesn't really matter what the source of that light is. It can be daylight, it can be blue light from your cell phone, it can be blue light from your iPad or your computer, or it can even be blue light from the street light outside of your bedroom window that is shining in while you're trying to get to sleep. All of that has a cumulative impact on our systems. 
And what that does is it suppresses melatonin secretion and it makes it more difficult for us to sleep. And there's been quite a bit of research looking at this um, that has shown that people sleep less and sleep less well when they are exposed to blue rich white light before bed. This is why we are encouraged to either wear blue blocking glasses or to um, activate the settings on our cell phones or our computers that dial down the blue light that they emit at, at a certain time at night. So hopefully folks are doing that on their cell phones and their computers. Um, if you have a street light outside your house that is shining into your bedroom, your recourse is really to put up some kind of curtains or in some cases, your city may be willing to come and put a back shield on that. In the city of Portland, um, you can do a fair bit of arm twisting and get the city to come out and do this, but they do not make it easy. In 2016, the American Medical Association released a report citing their concerns about certain health risks associated with exposure to blue rich white light at night. So breast and prostate cancers, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, retinal damage from looking directly at this kind of light, uh, glare and hazardous driving or walking conditions, again, from looking directly at this kind of light. Think about the LED headlights that are being installed on all of our new cars. They are very difficult to look at when you have oncoming traffic and you're in it, an otherwise relatively dark area, right? So folks are probably familiar with that. The American Medical Association in their report recommended that municipalities that were converting from high pressure sodium to LED really steer away from this blue rich white light. So not go with the standard 4,000 Kelvin LEDs, but something lower than that, like 3,000 Kelvin. Uh, this is a really kind of ugly slide, but it's really good news. The Department of Energy has historically uh, turned a certain amount of a blind eye to the both the human health and the ecosystem impacts of certain kinds of LEDs. They had tunnel vision and they were really looking at energy efficiency alone. Um, but they put out the solid state lighting 22, 2022 report, solid state lighting is LEDs. And everything that I've highlighted in yellow, I found to be such good news to find that they wrote in this report. So we now know that lighting unavoidably affects human health and well-being. Uh, it is now clearly understood that existing lighting practices can negatively impact human health and well-being. Roadway lighting, signage, and light spillage from buildings at night all have negative impacts on local wildlife. And lastly, currently, most LED lighting products and installations do not follow these practices, but LED technology has the capability to fully optimize all of these practices, so meaning best practices. So we have the technology at our fingertips to make better decisions about how we design our lighting, and we really just need, first of all, our um, governing agencies to get on board with this, and then we all just need to be educated about making better decisions about the kind of lighting that we are deploying out there. Uh, I wanna talk about public safety because this always comes up. We do have a tendency to believe that brighter means safer. And in fact, um, brighter does not mean safer and it doesn't uh, mean less crime either. We really need to start thinking in more nuanced and kind of complicated ways about how we design our lighting and what the relationship is between lighting and crime. So if we have overly bright lighting, that really creates very bright pools of light um, adjacent to dark areas that have deep shadows, which actually provide concealment for criminals. Uh, bright lighting can also create glare, which impairs our night vision because it constricts our, constricts our pupils. Particularly when we're talking about blue rich white light, the aging human eye, which means over 40, people, it's not over 60 or over 70, it's over 40, the aging human eye takes longer to recover from exposure to blue rich white light. So this is having an especially negative consequence for folks who are over 40. So we really just need to be designing our lighting more thoughtfully. Um, I want to throw out there that motion sensor lighting is actually better for deterring crime because it creates the element of surprise for somebody that's hanging around your house um, or your business with nefarious intent. 
Um, it also signals to you that somebody is outside. So I have a motion sensor light on my own front porch. If that light comes on, I either know that there's a person out there or there's a raccoon on my front porch, right? And so it gets my attention that there's something going on out front. This is just a nice photo illustration that shows a photographer taking a photo of a light that is totally unshielded in a side yard. Um, the, the camera in this case is now calibrated to the brightness of this unshielded light. When the photographer sticks their hand out and provides a makeshift shield, the camera can then um, change its calibration and see that there is actually a person standing here in this shadow. Our eyes work similarly. So if our pupils are really constricted, we can't see what's in shadow here. Um, this works much better in terms of our ability to see in various kinds of lighting circumstances. There's not a whole lot of data out there about the relationship between lighting and crime, but I will point out a few studies. This is called the Chicago Alley Lighting Project. It's from all the way back in 2000, but the Illinois Criminal Justice Authority did some um, research on alleyways in Chicago where they went in they looked at crime statistics prior to making some changes in lighting. Then they increased both the frequency of light poles and the wattage at each of those light poles, which is actually the brightness, not the wattage. And they found that crime increased 21% after they increased lighting in alleyways. Now, uh, one thing to note here is that you can't account for how that lighting increased reporting about crime but certainly increased lighting in these alleyways provided more light for criminals to work by, which we know that they need. This is a report from 1997, the National Institute of Justice preventing crime, what works, what doesn't, what's promising. And this is a direct quote from that paper, is street lighting an effective approach in the reduction and deterrence of crime? The answer is inconclusive. We have very little confidence that improved lighting prevents crime. And I actually think that when they say improved, they're using that to mean increased lighting. So not more thoughtfully designed, just brighter lighting. There was also a study um, more recently in 2018 by Arup International and Monash University in Melbourne, Australia. And they did research where they asked women to talk about areas where they had experienced crime or felt unsafe in the city of Melbourne. And then they overlaid that geographic data with lighting levels. And they found that there was a correlation between overly bright areas and places where women felt unsafe, especially if that light was blue rich white light. They found that the perception of safety was more correlated to having layered lighting and warmer colored lighting instead of this really intense um, bright white lighting, which again, produced really dark areas adjacent to the areas that were overlit. I wanna talk briefly about equity. These are just a couple of papers looking at light pollution and equity issues. The first one, cross-sectional association between outdoor artificial light at night and sleep duration in middle to older aged adults. They found that higher levels of artificial light at night were associated with short and very short sleep. And they also found that the associations between artificial light at night and short sleep were larger in neighborhoods with higher levels of poverty. So are we over lighting our poorer neighborhoods? It would, this would suggest that we are, yes. The second paper, Light Pollution Inequities in the Continental United States, a distributive environmental justice analysis. So Asian, Hispanic, or Black Americans had twice the mean exposure levels to light pollution in their neighborhoods than white Americans. And neighborhoods with higher proportions of people of color or renter occupants experienced greater exposures to ambient light at night. So again, we are over lighting our more diverse neighborhoods and our neighborhoods that have more renter occupants. Um, so in effect, our lower income neighborhoods. They also found that this pattern held up across urban rural contexts, which is pretty interesting. Uh, we are also living in an era of climate change. I'm sure everybody is very well aware of that. And what we know is that outdoor lighting is 13% of residential energy use, which is actually a pretty huge number if you think about it. 
13% of our outdoor lighting use in our residential areas. We also know this is from the International Dark Sky Association based on Department of Energy data that about 35 to 50% of light nationwide is wasted. That's because it's unshielded. It ends up in your next door neighbor's house and up in the night sky. That represents three to $5 billion a year of energy loss and 21 million tons a year of CO2 emissions. So making sure that we're not using more light than we need and that it's really directed where we need it and not in surrounding areas is uh, a key to reducing some of this wasted energy and light. These are best practices that have been developed by the International Dark Sky Association and the Illuminating Engineering Society. Minimize any unnecessary lighting. So if you don't need it, turn it off. Make sure it's fully shielded and aimed down, again, so that it's trained in the area where we need the light. Limit the total brightness so that it's not brighter than you need it to be, which is actually no favor to anyone. Uh, make sure that you're using adaptive controls where you can, so motion sensors or dimmers, and choose warm colors. So 3000 Kelvins or below, um, warm light, you want it to look just ever so slightly yellow. I mean, you can go all the way to amber if you want to, um, but anything that's a little bit yellower than that white light is what we're looking for here. I want to mention um, some work that is happening here in Oregon. This is the Oregon Sky Glow Measurement Network. It is a project of the International Dark Sky Association Oregon chapter. And what we have are these unihedron dark sky quality meters. Um, this is the dark sky quality meter. It's about 380 bucks a pop to buy one of these. And these are photosensitive and they are capturing photos of the night sky every five minutes all night long. We have 43 of them distributed around Oregon now with 15 more in discussion. And folks who are hosting these SQMs do um, quarterly downloads of the data. So you um, pull this weatherproof case open, you pull out the SQM, you connect it to your computer, and in about 15 minutes, you have all the data from the last three months. Here is a map of the distribution of those sky quality meters. So every yellow star on this map represents a place where there is already a sky quality meter deployed that is collecting information about night sky conditions. The um, kind of off-white circles that you see, these are locations where sky quality meters are in discussion. That means um, somebody is thinking about hosting a meter there. You will notice that here in the kind of Salem Corvallis area, we don't have any sky quality meters. So if anybody is interested, um, we would love to have a conversation with you. We are asking at this point that um, the host spring for the sky quality meter just because this cost really adds up. So 380 bucks. And then that you are able to perform a data download every three months. It's really pretty quick and easy. I'm not very techy and I can do it. I want to give you a brief update on what has been happening and is happening around Oregon. So in 2020, Sun River was designated as an international dark sky community. That means that they have taken measures to address their lighting so that it is dark sky friendly. And they have signed up with the International Dark Sky Association to receive this designation. In 2021, Prineville Reservoir State Park became the first state park in Oregon to receive an International Dark Sky Park designation. Um, there are others that are in the pipeline at this point. Cottonwood Canyon State Park, Wallawa Lake State Park are a couple of others that bear mentioning. In 2021, Yahats adopted a new lighting ordinance to control light pollution in their town. In 2021, Port Orford on the South Coast, which is an incredible place for night skies, um, they updated a, a dark skies ordinance that they had already developed, I think back in 2010 or 2012. So they updated it to really address LEDs and that kind of lighting that we've started to see since their original lighting ordinance. Portland, I am proud to say, is finally undertaking development of a lighting ordinance. We are long overdue to do this. Um, we are just getting started. I already mentioned Cottonwood Canyon is in the process of getting International Dark Sky Place certified. 
Uh, there is an effort um, between a bunch of entities, federal government entities, Travel Southern Oregon, um, to designate that really amazing area in southeastern Oregon that I showed on the map um, that they are calling the Oregon Outback as an international dark sky sanctuary. Um, that's a this is kind of a long haul because it's quite a large area and you need a lot of landowners and land managers at the table agreeing to this. Deschutes County is poised to begin an update to their um, outdated lighting ordinance. So hopefully we'll see that start to take shape very soon. And Portland Audubon, as well as the International Dark Sky Association, Oregon chapter, um, and others are working on House Bill 3202, the Oregon Night Sky Protection Act. This act would regulate lighting on state property, as well as properties that receive state funding such that the lighting would need to be shielded no brighter than necessary and 3000 kelvins or below. Um, it's in the uh, Joint Transportation Committee right now and we'll see if we can get it voted out of there. Okay, so how you can help preserve dark skies. So follow, first of all, follow best practices in lighting design year round at your own home and certainly talk to your friends and neighbors about the importance of not having unnecessary lighting on, particularly um, during peak migration seasons. Uh, you can help by closing your blinds and turning off unnecessary lights during peak migration. If you see these um, red alerts come out from Portland Audubon or IDA Oregon, certainly we would love to see Salem Audubon resharing them on social media, um, but also make sure you get your lights turned off and share this information with all of your friends and neighbors. Uh, we would love if folks would support our state level dark skies legislation. Stay tuned for more information about that as we make pro uh, progress. If you'd like to host a sky quality meter on your Salem area property, reach out to me um, and we can talk about that. I am not actually in charge of the project, but I can put you in touch with the guys who are. Um, and then engaging on light pollution issues via either Salem Audubon Society or the Oregon Audubon Council Network. Um, so all of these ways that we can just work collaboratively to reduce all of our unnecessary light pollution in Oregon. I wanna leave you with just a few pictures of inspiring, beautiful, aesthetically pleasing um, light that I've seen at night in public places. So this is Prairie Line um, in Tacoma. Really pretty interesting light. Now, of course, I did tell you that even dim light at night has impacts on our ecological systems, but we know that we have to have light at night. So we just need to design it so that we are minimizing our impact. Um, these are two photos of nice pathway, kind of wayfinding lighting that doesn't create a lot of unnecessary light. Uh, these two photos here are Herman Lake uh, Plaza in Houston really nice lighting, ambient, creates a, a beautiful sense of place, um, is great for navigating and isn't creating a lot of light pollution. This is uh, the waterfront in Vancouver, BC. Um, pretty interesting, artful lighting that creates plenty of light to be navigating by. And then a couple of examples from Portland of public art. We love to see public art on our buildings. The one on the right is called Mother Earth um, in Southeast Portland. It is lit, it might be hard to see, but there's a light here across the top of this uh, mural and it shines down on along this artwork. This is the Fair Haired Dumbbell in Northeast Portland. There are giant LED lights on the top of the canopies on every side of this building where you enter and they shine up the side of this building and on off into the night sky. So not how we would recommend designing the lighting. If you're gonna light your public art at night, light it from the top down. And that is where I'm gonna leave it. Uh, so feel free to hit me with questions, thoughts, concerns. Uh, thank you, Mary, for that. All that information <laughs> um, is the, yeah. <laughs> Let's turn the lights on here. Okay, hold on. Okay, let me get the lights on.
Oh, 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 oh. was that under 3,000 caliber? Oh. Uh, Nobody's going to sleep tonight, Tim. Um, is can you see those Kelvin ratings on on LEDs that you purchase? I don't remember seeing a Kelvin ratings. In some cases you can, and in some cases you can't. I have definitely bought um, motion sensor light bulbs on online that had a Kelvin rating clearly printed on them. But yes, in many cases it's sort of like lead ammunition. It's not very well labeled. Um, so you. And, you know, I will say that one thing that has gotten better is that if you go to Home Depot or Lowe's or a store like that, they oftentimes now do have those demonstration light boxes where you can punch a button in front of various light bulbs and you can actually compare the what those what the relative color of the light is coming off those bulbs. Um, but when in doubt, just choose something as warm as possible. Usually um, things will be labeled like laundry room lighting, utility room lighting, kitchen lighting. Those are gonna be very bright, blue, rich, white light. Um, things like, you know, lamp, um, bedside table lights, those kinds of things tend to be warmer lighting. But yeah, you have to do a little bit of work sometimes to, to find out what the Kelvin rating is. Thank you, Mary. Uh, I was wondering um, about surfaces. You alluded to light reflecting off of the surface and then back into the sky and that being a problem or a part of the problem. Uh, and I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about what one could do perhaps to minimize that on your own property. Yeah, I mean, the best thing to do to minimize it is to make sure that you're using um, the lowest lumens possible. It's kind of what we used to, the, the shorthand for how bright a bulb um, was used to be in the, in the high pressure sodium days or incandescent days, it used to be wattage, right? And you don't see that anymore because wattage is really a measure of the amount of energy it takes to produce a certain amount of light. But that doesn't actually tell you how bright the light is. So now we don't have wattage anymore, but we have lumens. And so um, you wanna make sure that you're choos choosing the lowest amount of lumens that you can for the job that you're gonna do. In some cases, you will still see wattage. I'm thinking of my front porch light now is rated at, I think it's eight watts. And it is a, it's an LED, it's a warm LED. It's on a motion sensor. It has a motion sensor right in the tip of the bulb itself, um, which does mean that if your light is in some kind of globe, it won't work. It won't read through that glass. So it needs to be an open bottom globe. Um, but eight watts is plenty. I could read a book on my front porch. It is, it is actually a lot of light, even though it doesn't sound like much. So the best thing that you can do in terms of reducing glare is just reducing the amount of light that you're actually putting on the on the situation. Um, making sure that your light is shielded will just keep it from sending light in a lot of different directions that can glare and bounce off of a lot of different surfaces. So if it's shielded, then you really just have to worry about the ground or the porch surface or whatever is below it. Um, so hopefully that helps. Motion sensors, I think, are great. I, you know, I'm a big proponent of a motion sensor for so many reasons. So I invited everybody in the Zoom audience to unmute themselves rather than using text if you want. Uh, any other questions in the room? I, Mary, I know that Tucson has been very successful at at uh, ordinances and and more than that, at, at, at being successful in in um, uh, in their lighting strategies, uh, shielded lights and low uh, Kelvin lights. How how did that happen? Yeah, Rachel? it is absolutely no coincidence that the International Dark Sky Association is headquartered in Tucson, right? And Rachel? on the on their staff, they have astronomers, they have um, astrophotographers, they have lighting designers, 
Um, so it is th that is really ground zero for a very thought forward thinking, thoughtful lighting. And they were able to do an incredible job of educating and influencing um, their city decision makers. And, you know, they did a few things in Tucson in some cases. In um, high conflict road areas, they reduced their nighttime speed limits. So if you go to Tucson, you will see in areas where there's a lot of congestion, you'll see a speed limit sign that has a higher number daytime and a lower number nighttime. So slowing traffic down is actually one of the things you can do to increase safety on our roadways without having to necessarily put in more lights or you know more crosswalks, although crosswalks are great too, particularly like pedestrian triggered flashing lights that don't have to be on all the time, that really catch drivers' attention, and then you don't have to have a ton of extra lighting on your roads. But I think, you know, one of the advantages Tucson has that I will tell you is it's dry there. And so certainly in the dead of winter in the Pacific Northwest, in Portland, in Salem, it's dark by 4.30 p.m., it's raining cats and dogs. As a driver, there are many times when I am worried about my ability to see a pedestrian. You know, kids these days, they're riding their bikes and they don't have reflective clothing on or, you know, bike lights and things like that. And I'm always very worried about that because we have so many conditions that make it hard to see. And I think that in places like Tucson where it's drier, it is a little bit of an easier sell to think about how you reduce your overnight lighting. They do dim their lights. Um, I want to say to 60% late at night. So certainly after rush hour is over, once the streets start to clear out, they dim their over overnight lighting. And they have reported that people don't even notice that the lighting is dimmed. So as long as you're doing something really strategically, comprehensively, thoughtfully, people get used to it. Your, our eyes get used to it. We get used to the driving conditions. Um, but I think that in places like Portland and Salem, we do have to uh, consider what all of the different approaches are. Reducing our nighttime speeds, re even reducing our own speeds personally, if it comes down to it. Um, but also just talking about the unintended consequences of light at night, because it's not benign. So what do we need to do to make sure that we have enough light to be navigating safely after dark, but not so much light that we're really diluting our night skies and having impacts on the ecosystem around us, which we are part of and we rely on for our own human health as well. We'll be closely monitoring your, um, your efforts to try to get some ordinances to uh, reduce unshielded lighting and reduce looms in you know, as a as a matter of policy for the city of Salem or for the city of Portland. Salem is really conducive to these conservation measures. And I think if if you can have some success in Portland, or maybe if you even if you can't, um, I, I think our, our city here is is um, you know, with the right information and the right encouraging could adopt those kinds of measures. They've been amazingly uh, responsive to conservation uh, efforts uh, that in terms of managing the park, especially the mark parks and recs people and managing their parks and setting aside uh, conservation uh, areas for wildlife. Uh, they, they seem to be really responsive to that as well as I believe our city council I think they just need the right argument. And yeah, that's so if you can have some success up there, or even if you can't, uh, I think we would reach out to you and and see if we can make a plea to, you know, starting with Parks and Recs, I think, because they're they're the most receptive here. And then they could make the argument to or the appeal to the city council. Yeah, that is that's really great to hear. And one thing I will mention relatedly is that our own Portland parks, um, they have now converted nine of our city parks to 3000 Kelvin lighting. Um, historically, they have had a 4000 Kelvin lighting standard, but they have moved to a 3000 Kelvin lighting standard. In the nine parks that have already been converted, I'm in um, 
conversation with the manager of that project, and he has indicated that they have heard no complaints from park users about the color of the lighting, the level of the lighting, concerns about safety, anything like that. So park users are satisfied, park managers are satisfied with the lighting, and so now they're going to start working toward that um, citywide in our park system. The other thing is that the Washington State Department of Transportation has moved entirely to 3000 Kelvin lighting, historically 4000 Kelvin. Our own ODOT has been very reluctant to make that change, though we have lobbied them since 2018, and they have been fairly intractable about that, um, though reasonably polite. But the Washington State Department of Transportation has been using 3000 Kelvin in areas around the Puget Sound, around Goldendale Observatory, around Rainier National Park, North Cascades National Park, in all of these places what, where either their own environmental department has asked them to use 3000 Kelvin because of habitat sensitivity or their neighbor, the National Park Service or Goldendale Observatory has asked them to use 3000 Kelvin lighting. And so they finally decided that they were so satisfied with the efficacy of that lighting and they really only wanted to be stocking one product and now they are um, moving to 3000 Kelvin statewide. So it does set a very good precedent for us here in Oregon. And I think that um, we will hope to see ODOT moving in this direction very soon. Um, we've lost Tim and Kim, I see that you have your hand raised. I don't know if you can unmute yourself. I see you can, okay. There is a question. Yeah, I can. I can, Mary. Thank you for a great presentation. I was wondering if you can give an update on what's going on with the House bill. The House bill. Yeah, I don't have much more of an update. Um, we had a hearing before the um, Joint Transportation Committee, and they were receptive, but there were some questions. Um, the bill was written as a modification of a House bill that Mitch Greenlick brought in 2008 that um, required that all lighting on state buildings be shielded. It was a fairly simple bill. It actually had a lot of loopholes and exemptions. I'm not sure that it has ever really been adhered to. I'm not really sure there are too many people that even knew that the bill existed. And yet it's on the books and has been since 2008. So the objective here was to update that bill to require not only state properties, but also um, projects that receive state funding that goes toward lighting. Um, they will be required to fully shield their lights um, spec them as 3000 Kelvin or below and use no more lumens than necessary, which actually leaves a, lo a whole lot of discretion, but it's just too complicated to try to write in uh, so many standards for how many lumens would be appropriate in all of the different potential conditions. So it's left fairly open. Um, we, we had a work group meeting with the Oregon Department of Transportation, Oregon Recreation and Park Association, um, OPRD, Oregon Parks and Recreation District, who are actually are, uh, very supportive. Um, the Department of Administrative Services, which they're essentially the people that are responsible for buildings and facilities. So we had a work group meeting with them on Monday to talk about what some of the issues are, what some of the exemptions are that we need to write in. Um, so now we are writing in exemptions, just things that are pretty common sense, like FAA lighting, anything that's a federal standard will supersede this, this standard. Um, so state ports and state airports and things like that, marine navigation lighting is not going to be affected by this bill. Um, sports fields and stadiums that have um, stadium lighting, they can't go 3000 Kelvin because competitive play requires 5,500 Kelvins. Ideally, they will move to um, state of the art, very good technology sports field lighting that is available now. All of our high schools and Portland public schools are, are under um, successive renovation and all of our fields are getting new lighting and it is brilliant. It's a, I mean, no pun intended. It's beautiful. beautiful. It's great. It's bright lighting, but it's very well trained on the field. So you can be 
on a property adjacent to Lincoln High School now while they're playing football. And you can tell sports field lighting is on, but it's, it's not the same amount of light spell that we've seen with the older lighting. So hopefully over time, as um, these lighting systems get converted, they will, they, you know, they will use this community friendly neighbor, uh, sports field lighting system. Um, there's no, we don't have a, we don't have a new hearing yet. There will have to be a new hearing to get a vote from the Joint Transportation Committee. And we will um, certainly put the word out to the Oregon Audubon chapter network um, through our IDA membership to make sure that folks know when there are opportunities for them to encourage their legislators to vote in support of this bill. Hopefully that answered the question sufficiently. Thank you, thank you Mary. Did, can, can you hear me okay? Yeah. I, I have, a, the reason I'm leaving the screen is I've got a, a mic here that's a wireless mic that I'm taking around to people who have questions in the room. And we do have a question from okay. somebody, you know, I think, uh, Marissa. I know Mary. Marissa in Salem. Yeah, Marissa, can you hear me? Hi, Marissa. So I just wanted to let folks know that Getting in on the International Dark Skies Oregon or whatever the brand ends up being um, meetings. And so I'd love to collaborate. I've been talking to Virginia Stapleton, who's our Ward 1 um, counselor about this issue, and she's on board. Um, it's just going to be, you know, they're doing a lot this year. So it may not be this year that we change our lighting ordinance, but some traction there. This now, I'd love to work with you all. Yeah. Awesome, Marissa. I'm so glad that you're there. Yeah, Marissa has been attending our Oregon International Dark Sky Association meetings for, I don't know, the better part of a year, huh, Marissa? And um, she's been doing great work doing outreach to local neighborhood associations and getting the attention of city councilors. And it's, it's so important to have local folks who are um, letting their electeds uh, know that this is an issue that's important to them and certainly talking to their neighbors because I think a lot of lighting is the way that it is because people just have no idea the impact that it has. In many cases, I think people don't even realize the impact that their lighting has on their neighbors, let alone their wildlife neighbors, right? Let alone their contribution to night sky pollution. And this really is cumulative impact. So it's going to take all of us making better decisions and certainly, you know, being open to conversations with our neighbors about how we can have lesser impact on one another. Any other questions? Well, that's another reason why you would want to get on the board for Salem Audubon is to help uh, shepherd this kind of an initiative this and some other conservation initiatives we're working on. Being on the board puts you in a good position to be directly involved in those kinds of um, actions. So I encourage you to talk to me about that. I hope you will. And thank you, Mary, for all this information. Uh, you know, we hear about dark skies a lot, but, uh, but uh, you've really given us uh, some ammunition and some uh, actions that we can take. And, and I hope we can have, have some impact here in Salem. Yeah, and as you all are enjoying all of the warblers and tanagers and thrushes that are moving in right now, right. Um, remember to think about how they flew overnight to get where they are. Um, if anybody is interested in hosting an SQM, it does feel pretty cool to be part of this incredible data set that we are collecting in Oregon, really pretty much unlike anything that's happening in any other state. You could probably get with Marissa tonight, who's in the room with you. Um, and she can put you in contact with the IDA board or uh, my email address at Portland Audubon is on the screen right now. And that's a perfectly fine way to contact me. You don't have to commit. If you want to know a little bit more about it and, you know, think about whether you can spring for the 380 bucks to buy the unit, um, we could just start a conversation. But we would like to get an SQM deployed in the Salem area soon. Well, I'd like to get one at the Nature Center <laughs> for sure. <laughs> It seems like a perfect place for one. It's outside of town, uh, and I don't know if that's your ideal uh, kind of position for one. Um, I'm not sure what kind of dark skies we have there, but it is influenced by the lights in Salem, for sure. And it, data we don't have right now, so it would be good to collect that data. 
Okay, okay we have an, another question. <laughs> the walking mic. Are you or are you looking more for a big wide open pasture? Uh, the beginning of the question cut out, but I'm taking this to be a question about placement of an SQM and what kind of ideal location it would be. I will tell you I'm looking out into my own backyard right now, which is a standard city lot in southeast Portland, and I can see the top of my SQM housing. So I don't have a big wide open space. I mean, what you do need to have is a clear view of the sky from the unit. So you wouldn't want to put it in a very heavily treed yard, but you don't have to have a big horse pasture either. Um, and we have SQMs all over the state, as I showed you. Some of them are in urban areas. Some, are the, some of them are in very suburban rural areas. So we're really looking for data from all over the place to get an accurate up-to-date map of what's happening in our skies in Oregon. Did that answer the question sufficiently? Yeah, yes, that, that was the question. Does, does the SQN require uh, uh, 110 and does it require internet uh, access? It is battery operated. So you put, ugh, I think six AA batteries in it every three months um, when you do the data download. It does not have to have um, an internet connection for the unit itself, but you do have to plug it into your computer, download the data, and then be equipped to email that data to our two board members who are in charge of this project. But the unit itself does not need an internet connection. And how often do you do that? Um, every, every three months. So every four, three time, months. four times a year. Mm -hmm. And it's really pretty quick you know, 15 minutes probably to download the data. Very good. Well, I think you're gonna get some takers. Great. <laughs> I would love to see one at the Nature Center because okay. we have a really good a view of the night sky there. And it'd be a good, a good place to have one, I think. Yeah, let's talk. I mean, one thing to think about is um, whether vandalism or theft is an issue. Um, so if it's on public property or property that can be accessed, it's ideal if it's, say, on a roof line or somehow out of reach, that maybe you can put a small ladder up to it to access it so that somebody else couldn't do that. If it's on private property um, and it's secure, it can be on a T-post in the ground or a fence post. The Nature Center is on, um, on uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife property. But we could, uh, we do have uh, the modus tower there, which is fenced off, and that would be one place for it. Or we can put it, uh, we could put it up on the building. We have uh, a, a classroom there that we could uh, maybe mount it up on the classroom so it's out of, you know, okay. out of reach. Sounds good. We could take a look at it maybe if I come down to do a condor talk. Oh, <laughs> yeah. At the Nature Center. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, thank you again, Mary. That was a yeah, wonderful was presentation. Great. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me and let's keep working together. Absolutely. Thank you all for 